two fireside chat participants. And so we have Mitchell Chang again, who just heard from the social uh, senior vice president of corporate social responsibility and education at Trend Micro. And we have Amir Mashkur, the infrastructure and security architect at Generali Global Assistance. And so gentlemen, maybe you can each kind of share a little bit about what those roles mean within your organizations and uh, how you support your enterprise. And then we'll dig right into the questions. So Mitchell, maybe you want to start? Okay. Yeah, I I actually, I, I've been with uh, Trend Micro for 18 years. And uh, out of that, I, most of the time I uh, run a customer technical support to help customers with uh, their issues with cybersecurity challenges and viruses. And uh, for the last two years, I've been uh, working on a corporate social responsibility education program where um, my goal is really to help the community from K-12 to uh, small business to universities uh, to better um, provide education and level of awareness to the back to the community. It's purely a nonprofit uh, 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 effort or initiative that we we're providing uh, because we want to give back something back to the community. That's great. Thank you, Mitchell. And Amir. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Daniel, for hosting this event and for everything. Uh, you know, all the work you've you put so far to, to make this happen. Uh, so I've been with Generali Global Assistance for over six months now, and my role uh, revolves around um, security and architecture. So it's uh, it's it's uh, it's a mixture of hands-on uh, experience and, and work in improving our overall security posture, and and uh, in, in, in scaling out to to our global platform uh, and. As you uh, as you know, uh, our services or our our department deals with identity protection, and identity protection and data privacy and data protection is at the core of our business. So, our, my role is uh, to improve the security for our platform and our data, and also educate our internal users on the importance of security uh, for not just you know our business but for our customers and end users. Great, thank you so much. I'm glad to have you both on the call here today, and I know we're going to cover a lot of ground, so let's go ahead and get started. And so, you know, uh, Mitchell, we'll start with you for the first question. You know, 2020, we've seen a lot of crises in 2020. My gosh, um, I think 2020 has shown us the full spectrum of possibilities when it comes to the types of crises uh, we can, uh, we as a pop we as businesses and consumers uh, can experience. How are cyber criminals taking advantage of these crises? You know, what are some of the tactics you're seeing them use? Yeah, uh, I think people are more vulnerable when we have a crisis such, and uh, cyber criminals definitely are taking advantage. Uh, we kind of kind of like seeing our, our session today within a flash. Within a flash, in a few months, we saw. Thousands uh, are millions of infection and uh, uh, thousands uh, uh, mortality within the COVID-19 issue. And uh, then uh, I'm based out of California, so we have a, a, a lot of fires going on lately out here. So when you have a crisis, uh, people are less guarded because they, they're focused, and uh, especially for small business or consumer, uh, on their everyday need. Like if they can not get PPE, uh, like a mask or hand sanitizer when you see somebody post on the web they're selling that you, even though it's a, a scam you you may kind of get lured by, by by those kind of scenario so we saw a big increase in email initially uh back in march and april uh especially the amount of spam that related to COVID 19 and uh, as you know spam could some could be malicious so the intention uh, uh, the actors actually leverage email to get you uh, lure into some sort of scam or, or get you to click on something and download malicious code that have a, may harm your computer or uh, having your system get compromised. Yeah, and you know, Amir, feel free at any point to jump in and Mitchell, ask Amir questions. Please, please feel free. I wanted this to be conversational throughout. So feel free to add, subtract, whatever you want to with this conversation. So, 
sorry, just to add uh, to what Mitchell uh, has mentioned. So our own resolution center has seen an increase of almost 760% in uh, unemployment fraud incidents. And it's affected our end customers, uh, a lot of them, and a lot of them were notified by their HR departments that someone has filed unemployment on their behalf. So bad actors and, and, and hackers and cyber criminals are always, uh, just like everyone else, are following the headlines, they're following the news, and they're, in the most cases, opportunistic. So there is a global event like COVID, and I cannot think of any any event that's at the scale and, and, the, and the size of COVID affected almost all the countries and all industries. Uh, cyber criminals will exploit these events to uh, through mainly what, what Mitchell has mentioned, which is uh, spear phishing and, and, and spam to uh, victimize businesses and users. And um, it's it's been a growing problem. Uh, thankfully, people are more aware of, of, uh, of this risk of uh, spear phishing, especially for COVID related uh, claims and, and emails, but it's still an ongoing issue. Yeah, and the you know these there's psychological attacks, right? These social engineering attacks in particular, because they know people are confused. They know people want information, and um, you know so they prey on these vulnerabilities. And not only do they prey on vulnerabilities in technology, right? But they're preying on vulnerabilities in humans you and want. their their want of information and clarity in their lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, if I, I may add that. Uh, I think the, the the worst form of attack we saw in a big rise in the, back in April and May was a uh, business email compromise. Uh, people uh, use a acronym BEC for sure, and uh, that's where social engineering really gets played in. They uh, the actors do reconnaissance of us like a small company, and they 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 usually act as uh, like a, a one of a chief officer of the company, like CEO send out an email to an employee say you need to transfer wire some sort of money to to another another account or for, to pay a vendor or something so so they really put in a quite a bit of effort combining social engineering the human factor and the technology to to try to uh uh hack into a, a, a other people's business and, and when if you're interested in the topic you're not familiar we do have uh, ncsa do have a quite Few uh, video archive uh, webinar archive we we done earlier a uh, couple months ago on this topic. That's great. Thank you. Thank you both for that. So Amir, I'm going to throw one your way. You know, as organizations, priorities will obviously shift when they're addressing immediate crises. Right? Mitchell mentioned fires. You know, when you're dealing with the impending fire, you might not necessarily be thinking about information security. And when you're thinking about the pandemic, you might not necessarily be thinking about information security. Um, but you need to keep your business open and operational. So how do business owners balance their shifting priorities while also staying resilient in the face of increased cybercrime? That's a great question, Daniel. So as you mentioned, a lot of businesses, most businesses, especially small ones, are thinking mainly about how are they going to open if they're not open yet and how do they keep their, their businesses afloat and their, their shops open and get you know all the PPE that they need and hand sanitizers. So cybersecurity is not something that's at the top of their priorities. But it's it's as important uh, to keep your, uh, your business secure and safe in the cyberspace as it is in, 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 in the physical world. So, one thing I'm a big fan of is the NIST cybersecurity framework. It's uh, it it might look intimidating when someone looks at it and all the components that are within that framework, but it's not really that uh, very far fetched. It's it's achievable even for small businesses. So it's very important to identify what assets you're protecting, what what's your most important and valued digital assets. So your customer data, your own your own business secrets, and then you will put controls in place to protect this these assets, this data. So implement data security practices, have awareness programs in place to educate your users and even your customers. So, for
for example, uh, you know, send an email to your customers to uh, to to uh, warn them against uh, a spear phishing or a phishing attack that you know the the actors are uh, they send emails that look like they're they're from that business, and and always have those security controls in place to maintain the security and the safety of your data. And then you have to you have to have controls in place to detect any breaches or anomalies or any events that indicate there's something going on uh, within your systems. And when that happens, you have to have a response plan. So you you need to have a response plan where you uh, you know what to do. You have a, it, it doesn't need to be a very expensive uh, uh, incident response team or software. You just need to know. Uh, this, these are the top 10 items I need to do when something happens. So need to be able to uh, restore from backups, for example, need to be able to mitigate and, and improve and, and find out what happens. And after that, you need to be able to recover, uh, you know, the, the, last, the last component in that, in that framework is to be able to recover and improve and, and, and uh, learn upon what happened in, the, in those previous incidents. In most cases, I think Mitchell will agree, it's not a matter of uh, if you will get breached, it's a matter of when you will get breached, what will you do? How will you deal with that breach? How will you recover from it? Because a lot of small businesses do not recover, unfortunately, from a cyber attack. And uh, they won't learn the lesson unless something catastrophic happens to the business uh, after a, a significant breach. So. It it's it sounds intimidating, but it's it's not really. It's 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 five or six. I think it's five simple components. And ask your IT provider, ask your MSP or your your IT contractor. Are you familiar with NIST? Are you aware of the NIST framework? How can you help me to implement uh, controls in place to, uh, to 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 keep my business uh, protected and to uh, to to have a plan if something happens. And how would I recover from it? So, things like you know monitoring your your data and who has access to it uh, is is very crucial. You have a lot of customers. You have a lot of employees. Do they all need to access this database or this component system that has all of your customer data? If not, start limiting access to to those data repositories. Also, um, make sure your your security software, your enterprise security software, is up to date. And can properly configured across all your uh, all your uh, hardware and, and, and systems. So your POS systems, your your computers, your uh, empl your employees' devices, excuse me, tablets, uh, uh, laptops, phones. They all need to be on the on the up to date for security patches because it takes one uh, one lucky attacker to get it right and it breach your network. You have to get it. Uh, right all the time. Attackers have to get right once only to be inside your network. You know, and that really underscores when you talked about reaching to your network, to your managed services providers, your IT vendors. And, you know, small businesses often feel like they have to do everything themselves. And, and with cybersecurity, with the complexity of it, it's it, it's just not realistic for a small business owner, particularly one who isn't a cybersecurity expert, to manage this complexity. I mean, you think about it, we outsource often our finances or, you know, or to an accountant to make sure that they, our taxes are done appropriately. We outsource to a lawyer to make sure we have our agreements in place. You know, we're getting to the point where the, the threat is so real and the complexity is such that we need to have a trusted partner, a vendor, someone, uh, a cybersecurity expert in our community, someone to turn to, who can help you with this? And so I, I, I'm always an advocate of that. Um, you know, it, it, that should be part of your plan, <laughs> part of your business plan. Who who is your partner in this? I think that's great. Yeah. Well, one one example I like to add is also when uh, small businesses are facing crisis and uh, a lot of issues with their business. I think the one critical factor, especially for the smaller business, not a medium business, where they don't have IT, they like uh, individuals have to work, work more from home versus uh, having an office set up. Uh, the, the assumption people may make is, well, I take my laptop home and plug in. 
all everything going to be business as usual but but you had to um be careful with that because your home security may not be as robust it is uh for, for the for the network and computer may not be as robust as what you have in office and the key there is individual and companies are small business home business have to provide the data for, for their customer and that that's what attacker hackers going after uh I, I for example just like a physical security right when, when you're in an office building you may have a 24 7 security badge reader and uh and, and these sort of things but when you move to home you may not have exactly the same kind of setup and computer security network security is exactly the same uh because your your firewall and your your network may not be as robust but but that will create additional weak point weak link into what hackers to come into your system that's great and that actually leads into our our next question but i'll i'll add to that because fbi and i think cisa jointly just released a, an alert last i think it was last week about individuals who are going to hotels and using hotel wi-fi um for work because maybe they have stronger wi-fi than their home or they feel like they just need to get away and so they issued an alert on using public Wi-Fi uh, to access your business networks. And so, you know, that, again, that leads to my next question about telework, right? So many people are working remotely. Some organizations have said, you know what, we're just gonna do it permanently um, and we won't come back to the office. So with our homes, now the hub of connections for work, it's the, the hub for learning, right it's the hub for all of our entertainment because we can't go to the movie theater or you know the opera so what you know how can we reduce our vulnerabilities at the central hub of all of our connections what, what steps can businesses take if they're doing all their connections at home how can they lock down uh, their routers and their home connections well uh uh, I, I think I think first, first of all, just a, uh, some regular cyber what we call cybersecurity hygiene. Those are more important than ever. For example, use strong strong password and uh, uh, and multi-factor authentication because your, your entry point now is not just from the office, uh, but you may have different locations, even like work remotely from from a hotel room. You know, for folks who may have to deal with local fires and and uh, but, but 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 each one of those area that will present additional challenge and uh, and, and uh, I think also that there's a convenient factor when you're at home you just plug into your regular Wi-Fi router so you may want to you know either consult or take a look at that and. Uh, kind of clean up the, the, those setup because a lot of people at home, you just have a default router with a default uh, password to log in. This is administrator, for example, you, you just take the step to kind of, kind of check, kind of tighten these security measures. And uh, I would not recommend you use the same computer, do business transaction, and uh, same as what your, your kids or family member are playing. Uh, online games and then you know the, these kind of uh sort of cyber hygiene kind of uh topic uh, certainly needs to be revisited and uh, also daniel i think you mentioned a good point i, I think some people there's more knowledgeable and uh, more they they, they kind of like to uh handle the, com the, the computer work and so they can set up their it be their kind of own it but for, 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 for most of folks, uh, you know, you need to find good, good help, like your system integrator or uh, the, the, the vendor who provide you the security uh, is, 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 is on the technical side of things. That's that's actually quite important. It's kind of like, kind of like the cars, right? Some people like to be their own mechanic, fix their own car. You know, if you're, if you're not a mechanic, it's, it's important you have a level of awareness on the key issues and challenges and, and because uh you know for example car you, you may have a knowledge of every, every 40 thousand 30 thousand miles you got to change tires and and potentially fix the brake and so so if you're not aware of that then then you're going to get yourself in trouble yep 
And if, if I may add to that, uh, Mitchell and Daniel. So uh, Mitchell mentioned uh, several practical uh, steps people can take to secure their work environment from home, um, like changing the default insecure uh, settings in your router, um, maybe maintaining uh, uh, separate devices for work and for uh, for uh, for uh, you know fun and leisure, anything other than work. But if you look at uh, a typical office network, uh, small and mid businesses, uh, typically there is a protected network where your uh, your sensitive devices are connected to, and there is a guest network for your customers and and uh, everything that doesn't need to talk to those sensitive systems. When you go home, that changes. Even if you have uh, your you know your a secure uh, password on your Wi-Fi, secure Wi-Fi password that's not easy to crack, uh, even if you have an up-to-date router at home, uh, all these devices that you have at home now, so your smart TV, your ring doorbell, uh, your light bulb, uh, your toaster, your microwave, uh, and your uh, your work laptop can talk to each other now. So one of the practical things I think that people can, can take, and uh, again, if, you, if you're not comfortable doing that yourself, talk to your local IT integrator, your your IT MSP uh, have a separate network in your house. It doesn't need to be a, a you know a multi hundred or multi thousand dollar Cisco router. You can buy an off the shelf router and just configure that with a Wi-Fi network just for your work laptop and your work devices, so that you reduce the visibility between all the IETs you have at home that are not usually kept up to date all the time with security patches. Uh, not all businesses, not all companies that that make IoT devices, make sure that they're up to date with security patches. So you want to reduce that visibility into your work laptop from your IoT devices, and and when you're home, uh, you tend to so when you're in the office, you tend to access file servers uh, that are available to you, uh, access customer data or any sensitive data. When you're home, now you need to access this data. A lot of times people will end up downloading them into their machines and just keeping them there forever. So it's it's very important to sanitize your 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 machine from any data that doesn't need to be on your work machine anytime and anymore. And in addition to that, uh, Mitchell mentioned physical security. That's a great point because you, again, you you uh, at the office you have security, you have a security system. Uh, you know you can you can provide that layer of of protection against. Uh, theft or, or vandalism. But if you're home, you leave your work laptop, you go for a two or three day vacation, you come back, someone broke in and they stole their, your work laptop, then all your customer data is now exposed. So it's very important to turn on uh, full disk encryption on all your work devices. And it's 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 easy and relatively uh, speedy nowadays to turn it on on your Windows machines or your uh, MacBook laptops or any system for that matter. And uh, always be mindful of what you install on your on your uh, work machine, whether you're in the office or you're at home. So, say you need some some tool to extract text from PDFs. A lot of us, sometimes myself included, need to uh, tend to just Google something, and you find the first two or three items, and you download that software, and you know, hope that it does what you want to do. And it sometimes it does, but you you just added a lot of uh, binaries and code to your system that doesn't need to be there and you haven't even vetted uh, that software vendor or that application developer. So it's very important to be cognizant and, and, and aware of what you install in your machine, uh, especially your work laptop that accesses uh, secure and private and sensitive information. So these are some some uh, practical steps that I can think of is to make sure you're, you're always, uh, you know, you boost your security and you're you're more uh, defended against cyber attacks that target uh, remote employees specifically. Yeah, no, those are great points. And, and uh, I'm glad you brought up also physical security as far as lost devices, because employees lose devices all the time. Right? And so, um, or stolen devices. And so that's a great um, piece of that that we often forget. And, you know, so I've been talking about with the internet connected um all the internet connected vacuums and refrigerators and everything else and these listening devices you know our tvs have listening capabilities remote controls you know 
think of the listening devices that you have in your house. And if you're having sensitive, confidential, uh, you know, intellectual property discussions or contract negotiations in your home right next to a listening device, you know, something you say might trigger uh, that listening device. And so just, again, thinking of the physical security and layout of your office and your uh, your home, as well as some of those technical controls that you both talked about. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I have, a, I have one more uh, critical item I, I forgot to mention is uh, backup. Uh, I think related to backup, what we see, uh, I, I know the audience are familiar with ransomware attack, uh, is the name suggests ransomware attack is that where the hacker or hacker uh, usually trying to lure you to click on something through most likely an email. And then what they do is once you click on their uh, phishing, spear phishing email, then you will launch, uh, basically open up your back door, allow them in, and they will encrypt your 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 hard drive or your disk. And um, and so then they will, they will post something on your screen, say you got to pay ransom with the Bitcoin or something, or else you're not going to get your data back. And uh, I think we, we discussed this a lot in our uh, webinars that, you know, first, first of all, users should, should never entertain the pain of ransom. Even you pay them, there's no guarantee you get your data back. And uh, so, so having a frequent and robust backup plan is quite important. And, uh, and I think, uh, right, you know, for, 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 for these days, there's a lot of good cloud backup Microsoft, Google, everybody offered some sort of backup utility. I think the, I think you, you, you need to, do need to take some time and just make sure that is set up and also uh, check the security settings. And uh, because uh, sometimes when you have the backup, you are uh, you backup data, you may do some sharing and, and those could be very dangerous as well. Hmm. And if you're backing up to a local drive, which a lot of people, especially with with MacBooks tend to do because uh, it's very convenient, very easy to do, to do it with uh, with Time Machine. Make sure that it's encrypted because uh, that hard drive is lying around. If someone grabs the laptop, they can drive. They can grab the hard the, the hard drive as well. And since we're talking about physical security, uh, you know, saying you know, one is none, two is one. So if you have backups of your backups in case your primary backup uh, method fails uh, when you need to restore. So if you have a hard drive, have a hard drive and remote encrypted backup as well, just in case you can't access uh, either of those. That's great. So we and we did have a question come in from in the chat. And again, individuals who are in attendance, you're more than welcome to uh, send us questions um, about, you know, we had talked about evaluating. Amir, you mentioned evaluating some of your software uh, providers and stuff. And I had talked about finding someone like a managed service provider who can help you. And so, uh, you know, Ronald asked, how does a small business know that their IT service provider is skilled in cybersecurity? Are all IT service providers managed ser- security service providers? So so maybe we can differentiate between IT and InfoSec and how to evaluate whether or not someone is capable of handling our cybersecurity for us or being a partner in that. Yep, so you're right. Not all MSPs are cybersecurity experts as well. Uh, some of them, uh, many of them provide those services, but really talk to them and, and talk to them. I think before you have that discussion, you have to educate yourself a little bit. Look up this, look up uh, certain cybersecurity uh, frameworks and ask them, did, are they aware of NIST and, and how have they, have, do they have a framework in place uh, to, to implement those policies and those practices uh, for small business specifically, not just uh, for any type of business and get a reference sheet for their other customers. Have that go to meetups, local meetups in your area, uh, security meetups, small business meetups, and ask others, what do they do in that realm? What, who do they use? Do they like them? Are they, are they satisfied with their services? Do they provide a full uh, life cycle security service or do they just go in, install a firewall, uh, you know, and just patch the router every three months? It's very important to, to uh, delve into what they actually do for you and not just provide you with a code of, you know, uh, a, a firewall installation or uh, some some fancy security appliance that they will install and, and charge you for on a yearly or, or monthly basis. 
That's great. We have the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, we have a, 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 a vendor security checklist uh, full of questions, and it's at staysafeonline.org uh, in our resource library. And it has a lot of questions that you can uh, do your due diligence and ask questions yep. um, of them that if you're not a cybersecurity expert, that list might help you out with some of the questions. Um, and it's always important to engage with in a specific, not a handshake agreement, but an actual agreement that articulates what exactly services they will be providing you and when, so that you know um, if you're covered or not. Yep. All right. Um, so, you know, it's often difficult to convince business leaders at both large and small organizations that making an investment in cybersecurity should be a priority. You know, sometimes it's hard to convince small businesses uh, in particular that, you know, when you have limited resources, um, that some of those limited resources should be dedicated to cybersecurity. So in your opinion and in, in your experience, how is investment in cybersecurity um, a good business decision? Well, um... If you equate back the value of your data and liability you're carrying, let's say you have a, you're a, like a doctor's office, you have patient's information, and if that information gets breached, the liability, you know, in the lawsuit or whatever that may occur is huge. That, that could put, and I think often put small business out of business. And, but if you look at the amount of investment, you, you buy on the security, set up your security software, or, or pay some system integrator, help, help set up a, a good security posture. It is actually, you know, a fraction of, of potential liability there. And it, it's, uh, and, 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 and all, I think also we, we've seen an increase in cyber security uh, insurance lately. And uh, but, but the, the tools and the technology you, you invest is actually ROI is quite good if you, you, if you kind of equate to the, the risk there. Yes, so in, in addition to the legal and the, uh, the financial losses that uh, you might suffer as a small business owner in case of uh, a cybersecurity breach, the thing that the asset that you will uh, lose which is probably one of the most important to you is your customers trust in in your in your business so especially for small businesses because uh, big corporations big companies uh, can recover from this they can they can uh, people will still go to them they can throw millions uh, tens of millions of dollars on on uh, security teams and professionals and tools and appliances but really if if something if all of your customers' uh, info is leaked online, uh, you will lose that customer most likely, uh, especially if there are other alternatives to uh, to to the customer. So, uh, investing in your in your cybersecurity, in your business cybersecurity is investing in your business. It's not investing in an accessory or in in something that you might need or might not need in the future. And it, it's very important that that investment is continual. So. You can spend uh, money on consultants to come and, to come and set up uh, your uh, security appliances and put uh, policies and, 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 and practices in place. It's very important to keep assessing those controls uh, on a regular basis to make sure that they're working for you and there are no gaps uh, in your security plan uh, to, to make sure that you're secure. Um, so uh, Mitchell mentioned something about uh, cybersecurity insurance and insurance policies. Uh, small businesses have the option to get cybersecurity protections uh, for uh, for them specifically targeted to small businesses. One example of that is uh, Mastercard. Mastercard offers small businesses cybersecurity solutions uh, that provides ID monitoring, uh, resolution services, uh, including monitoring uh, sensitive data like EINs and DUNs and 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 business credit reports. So. Uh, you, you need to keep an eye on on your uh, on your valuable uh, da sensitive data, just like you're monitoring your social security number as a person, and your credit monitoring uh, services. You need to monitor your business specific identifiers and and and, and sensitive data as well. 
Those are all great points. Thank you. And yeah. the only yeah. thing. And then I like to go ahead and add, just give you an example how 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 um, the important security is. Uh, when I was running customer support uh, a few years back, uh, when customer or large enterprise customer, big corporation, when they purchase security software and uh, set up the, the, their environment, uh, usually the, the person who sign off that we interact with is maybe a, a security uh, IT director or manager uh, level folks. But, but when they have a breach, if the event really happened, their system get compromised, their network's down, it's a customer support uh, head for Tremicro. I, I get a call directly from CIO or CEO. And there, there's an instance where I got a whole executive team on the line and uh, try, try to get us to help them, you know, to, to re reestablish the network. So, so you can see the contrast there. Uh, even the money we spend is very low in the lo uh, level of sign off in the organization, but the risk is huge. No, that's great. And the, um, you know, an, another angle with this, particularly if you're looking at trying to justify investment in cybersecurity to leadership is also, you know, other businesses and their willingness to partner with you and do business with you, right? If you don't have a strong security posture as a business, uh, the federal government, you're seeing that, right? With Department of Defense and the cybersecurity maturity model certification that at some day will roll out. Um, <laughs> You know, you're seeing that organizations are putting a lot more emphasis on evaluating other businesses that they do business with. And so, um, you know, if you can articulate and demonstrate through um, your policies and procedures and your training programs and all of the steps you're taking to secure your business, uh, that that is another angle of trying to make a business case, a good business case for investment in security to demonstrate that you're resilient and that you're not gonna be uh, the weak link in someone else's supply chain. Um, so I want to, because we're getting near, you know, we have 15 minutes left. I want to talk about some empowering things, right? Many small business owners and employees feel defeated when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, because again, it's a complex topic, it's not easy. Uh, and particularly for non-technical individuals, it's uh, just not something easy to talk about. Many people don't even know what cybersecurity means. <laughs> what is this term? You know, so speaking directly to the non-technical people, you know, whether they're looking to improve their personal or their business cybersecurity, where should they start? What are some good uh, building blocks for improving your personal or business security? I think the first step uh, when you, as a small business owner who often uh, wears multiple hats, and in most cases are not a cybersecurity expert, is to look at what's the most important asset that you have, digital asset in your business. It's your data, your customer data, your sensitive uh, company information identify where that where that what that data is and where that data is stored and where is it being processed and then create a security plan around that so this is what you want to protect this is what you want to uh, monitor for breaches and for compromises and this is what you want to back up and make sure that the backups uh, are good and they can be restored at any time and your security plan will revolve around that so when you when you start talking to MSPs, to professionals, to uh, to to organizations who will help you uh, build your cybersecurity plan, you need to do that. This is your due diligence: is to look because you know your business, you know your uh, your assets, you know your customers, you know what's to be protected, and what's uh, what's absolutely sensitive and shouldn't be exposed. So, uh, like. In addition to, to knowing your data, you have to know what happens or what's the recovery plan if that data is exposed. This is something that you will work with your uh, cybersecurity professional, but backups is one thing, but backups are part of a, your disaster recovery plan. Uh, but just going back to your question, where do you start? I think you should start with 
with your data and what's what's being uh, what's supposed to be protected with your cybersecurity plan. That's great. You can't protect what you don't know you have, right? Yeah. So you have to start with identifying the crown jewels. Exactly. That's great. Yeah, and also I think for me the one word is awareness. Uh, and because things are moving so much faster now than let's say 10 or 15 years ago, where viruses, the way they the attacking is through a single vector and not very complex. And a lot of times they just make some noises, they will go away. And but today there is there's there's organized crime, there is uh states attackers, and there's just a lot of for-profit organizations are trying to get into uh the cyber uh, attacking business and uh, so things are moving re relatively much faster now and uh think that that's not going to change from my perspective because uh we, we're going to have a uh, million and billions of devices coming online that's smart devices uh what, what we talked about earlier internet of things uh these are the smart refrigerator smart tvs and there's going to be more and more of those so awareness on the top top issues be, uh, is quite important, and then 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 kind of figure out where you find help. But with some of the awareness, you, you don't really have to spend too much time. They will present themselves to you because if you have a mobile phone today, most likely not only you're potentially getting some phishing emails, but you may get some smishing spam uh, text messages. Our voice message, um, voice uh, calls where people pretend to be somebody else, try to scam you into doing something uh, that will hurt yourself. That's great. It, you know, the awareness is so important because so much investment is often focused on just technology, right? But we also need to balance that investment with investing in training our employees. And because if we don't make that investment, you know, once once an email gets past all of our sophisticated technologies and lands in that inbox, then it's up to that employee whether or not to click on that link or not, right? Or to click on that text message. And so we have to balance that uh, yeah. the training of the humans with the implementing technology solutions. Yeah, and awareness I'm talking about not so much you have to understand how firewall works or how, right. how uh, uh, network security works in detail, but just aware that, for example, there is this uh, uh, technical support fraud where they they will come in, uh, pop up a window on your browser when you're and say your your machine's infected. Actually, your your machine's running fine. They're just using uh, some security hole to to pop a message on your browser. Ask you to click on something, and then once you click on that, it actually download malicious code to infect your machine, and then they want you to call a number to give them a credit card so they can help you clean your machine. So aware that there's fact, these kind of scenario is quite important. Yeah, that's great. Actually, CISA and FBI just recently released a notification about some voice phishing scams where criminals are calling new employees and claiming to be IT support, saying that they wanna help them configure their virtual private network and so the criminals are getting the credentials for the VPN. Um, and of course, how do they learn that an employee is new? Well, we share that on LinkedIn and anywhere else, right? <laughs> we got a new job. And so, yeah, that, that awareness and helping employees know the different ways that criminals can target them is really important. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the event and we'll see you back in Hoover. Right. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Mitchell.